radio's own show, Behind the Mic. Radio, with a switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But radio isn't all on the surface. There are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now, presenting a man whose name since the beginning of broadcasting has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Thank you, Gil Martin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. Behind the Mic presents one of the most versatile character actors in radio. When a radio director is casting a show and he wants a man who can play a Scotchman in one part of the show and a pack of wolves in another, he probably hires our next guest. You might have heard him as the villain on the Dick Tracy program one night and as a funny voice on the Fred Allen show another. As a matter of fact, he plays so many parts that I suggest you be mighty careful about swatting a moth in your closet. It just might be Charlie Cantor. Charlie, Charlie, exactly what kind of dialects do you do? Well, uh, Monsieur McNamee, I can do a French dialect like this, if you prefer. I can also play the part of a blooming cockney from his ten with pearl buttons. And if you don't like that, well, doggone bless my ass britches from Memphis, I can stand here with my bare feet hanging out and talk like this, yeah. <laughs> but I can talk a little like I've just been kissing the blondie stone. <laughs> uh, maybe you like a little Italian by then, eh, like this? <laughs> then I can play the Scotchman. Like the Scotchman who went to the dentist and asked how much to pull my tooth. And the dentist says, two dollars. And the Scotchman said, okay, here's a buck, just loosen it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Charlie, I, I suppose you speak English too. Uh, my friend, you're asking, so I'm telling. <laughs> you can take everything away, but don't take away my Yankee accent. <laughs> You not only do dialects, but you also play those two popular little characters on the Fred Allen show. Uh, oh, yeah. You mean the, the dopey man who talks uh, something like this, yeah. And uh, the little man who talks way up here like this, yeah. Yes, I do, Graham. <laughs> well, a couple of weeks ago, Charlie, we had a man on this program who impersonates animals. Yeah, what does he do? Uh, impersonates animals, animals Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you also impersonate animals? Well, yes, Graham, for comedy purposes. For instance, on one program, I was called to do a, a lovesick chicken, which sounded something like this. <laughs> and uh, once I was called upon to do a parrot, which sounded something like this. Hello, buddy, 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 buddy. Hello. Another week, I was called upon to do a hen laying an egg, and it sounded something like this. <laughs> I wonder how a program sounds when it lays an egg, Charlie. Well, I hope I never find out. <laughs> <laughs> Besides playing dialects and characters on shows, what other unusual things do radio directors call upon you to do? Well, lots of things, Graham. For instance, I'm uh, generally called upon to do funny laughs. One show, I had to do the laugh of a man who was looking over the shoulder of another man who was reading the funnies in the subway, and as the paper doesn't belong to him, it was a sort of a, a repressed laugh, like this. <laughs> Then there's the timid laugh that I have to do at times like this. <laughs> and then, uh, still another comedy show, I had to do a laugh like a man who was waiting outside of the delivery room in a hospital. <laughs> His wife is expecting a baby. The nurse comes out and tells him it's a boy. <laughs> also a girl. <laughs> another boy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Folks, when I said he was versatile, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> Charlie? 
Just out of curiosity, did you have any theatrical experience before you got into radio? Well, Graham, I've been in radio 11 years, but I did play in vaudeville for quite some time. When I was in school... High school? Uh, well, I won't say it was college, but my brother was a vaudevillian, and he had a comedy act. During the summer, he used to fire his straight man, and I'd substitute for his straight man for eight weeks, and in that way, make my school tuition expenses for the whole year. And do you know who the first straight man my brother fired to make room for me was? No, who? Archie Leach, who is now better known as Cary Grant. So Cary Grant was fired so you could take his place. That's right, Graham. Well, is there any chance of RKO doing that to Cary now? No, oh, I wouldn't <laughs> let him, Graham. Gosh, I wouldn't let him railroad me into that. No. <laughs> I'd hate to play those mushy love scenes opposite Loretta Young oh. or Myrna Loy or Hedy oh. Lamar. Oh. No, a thousand times no. <laughs> All right, Keeper, I'll come quietly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charlie Cantor. <laughs> Oddities in radio. <laughs> Presenting odd little true stories that help make radio sometimes amusing, sometimes exasperating, but always interesting to the people in it. Oddity number one. A few years ago, newscaster Mark Hawley was master of ceremonies on a program for a shoe account emanating from Buffalo. The commercial announcement was done by two women, Mrs. Miller and Mrs. Johnson, who talked over the back fence about things pertaining to shoes. One day, the time of the broadcast was changed. Through sheer forgetfulness, the two women who did the commercials were not notified. Hawley and his announcer didn't realize this until just before the show and nothing could be done. When they came to the commercial, there was only one thing to do and the announcer and Hawley did it. They slipped into falsetto and... Uh, how are you this morning, Mrs. Miller? Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Mrs. Johnson. Oh, yeah, how's the family? Oh, everybody's fine except little Willie. His corns are bothering him. He's got arch trouble. Oh, he has? Yes. Well, you know, George Jr. had the very same trouble, and we found the most wonderful shoes. That's and they're so simply fun. marvelous. <laughs> they went on and on. After the broadcast was over, Holly, worried to death, got a phone call from the sponsor. Yes. Yes, well, I can explain. I, I can... want to know who those two women were. Well, uh, uh, they were just uh, two women who we called in because, well, uh, we were in an emergency. And... Well, they were terrific. Get rid of those two regular women and we'll hire them. <laughs> <laughs> Oddity number two. Years ago in the early days of radio, when NBC was still at 711 Fifth Avenue instead of its present palatial quarters at Radio City, radio was not quite the almost perfect technical thing it is today. For instance, in those days, there was no emergency lighting system. And if the lights in the studio went out, the studio was dark until the lights were fixed. For a few brief seconds, we take you back to those early days of radio when there was an unwritten rule that if the lights went out when an orchestra was playing, the orchestra would perform Dixie because that was the one number all the boys could play together without looking at their music. Well, one day, Frank Black was conducting his orchestra and the lights went out at the finish of a number. Instead of the next regularly scheduled selection, the orchestra went into... At the finish of Dixie, the studio lights were fixed and the orchestra resumed its regular program. Suddenly, the lights went out again. And that's exactly what happened. All I can say is, if that ever happened to our orchestra leader here, Ernie Watson, he'd drop dead. <laughs> Oddity number three. A few weeks ago, Samuel Kaufman, radio feature writer, hailed a taxi. Hey, cab. Take me downtown to the New York Sun. Know where it is? I know all the ways to get there. Oh, you do, eh? Well, take me the short way. Oh. Say, buddy, you got a radio back there. What do you say you turn it on? No, thanks. I don't want to hear the radio. 
Well, maybe you don't, but I do. Oh, I see. Well, where do you want me to turn it? You turn the dial, I'll tell you. Yeah, that's right, right there. Now turn on the juice. Uh, just a moment. And pop my curiosity. But who do you want to listen to? A guy I never miss. Uncle Don. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Uncle Don, Uncle Don conducts a well-known kiddie program. Thank you, Sam Kaufman. You played the part of yourself to perfection. <laughs> Favorites, favorite food. In the upper reaches of New York's theatrical district, where actors are legion, Schubert is king, and Damon Runyon and Walter Winchell are court chroniclers, there is a restaurant which has become as much of a habit with some of your favorite radio stars as worrying about their Crosley ratings. And for no particular reason, we thought you listeners might be interested in some of the food habits of your radio favorites and what they eat. So we have brought you the man who can best give you this information, the proprietor of Lindy's, New York's famous restaurant, Leo Linderman, or Lindy himself. <laughs> Lindy, suppose you start telling us about the food habits of the famous radio personalities who put on the feed bag in your restaurant. Who would you like to hear about, Graham? Oscar Levant? Yes. Uh, what is Oscar Levant's favorite food? Well, Graham, I think it must be coffee, because when he comes into my restaurant, he will drink at least ten cups. <laughs> That's probably what keeps him so wide awake on information, please. Then do you know what he likes to do? He likes to steal cookies and macaroons out of the cake box. Naughty, naughty, Oscar. One more swiped cookie and Papa will take away your inside of Peter, your Britic Britannica. <laughs> I can't say Encyclopedia Britannica. Did you know that? <laughs> well, <laughs> how about some other favorites? Uh, say Eddie Cantor. Well, Eddie is crazy about well done hamburgers. He generally starts his dinner with a little dry sherry, and then he's very fond of bologna and eggs. Well, when he comes into your restaurant, does he eat by himself? Oh, no. Eddie is crazy about company. He generally comes in with his wife, Ida, and a party of 10 or 12 people. How would you like to hear about Jack Benny? Yes, I would. Because if eating has anything to do with the salary Jack makes, I'm going to change my diet. Then you better start eating lots of fish. Jack's favorite seems to be sturgeon and Nova Scotia salmon sandwiches, and for dessert, he has... Yes, I know that product he advertises. Boynton and Allen also like all kinds of fish. Well, how about a real gourmet, like uh, Paul Whiteman? He's not a gourmet anymore. He used to love rich foods. You mean the days when he was known as uh, two sleepy people? Yes, but that was before he went on his diet. Now when he does come in, which is very seldom, he eats things like boiled steak, a lamb chop, gluten bread, and for dessert, stewed food without sugar. Mm, so that's how Paul keeps his schoolgirl figure, eh? Yes, Walter Winchell has a pretty heavy appetite for a tin man. Because of his work, he generally eats dinner about 2 o'clock in the morning. He always asks if there's anything left over from dinner, and he will have that. He likes all egg dishes and fish, and like Eddie Cantor, he's a bologna and egg feed. He's also very fond of conversation of marinated herring. <laughs> Lindy? I think we have just about time for one more celebrity diet. What about J. Edgar Hoover? He makes radio speeches once in a while. Well, that's kind of stretching a point. But just out of curiosity, what is J. Edgar Hoover's favorite fodder? He likes all meat and lots of it. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, the next time I pass him, if I find myself without an arm, I'll know what happened. But thank you, Lindy. Thank you very much for the fodder folder of <laughs> behind how a cab driver became a successful radio and Broadway show writer. Recently, a new musical comedy hit came into Broadway through the applause of the critics. The show was Hold On To Your Hat, and it starred Al Jolson. One of those responsible for the funny book of the show is a fellow named Eddie Davis, who for the last few years has been very successful as a radio writer. But before Eddie Davis got into radio... Oh, but here he is, and we'll let Eddie tell it himself. Eddie Davis. <laughs> Eddie, before we go into the start of your career, 
Will you please tell the audience who are some of the radio comedians for whom you've written? Well, for six years, I was one of Eddie Cannon's writers. He gave me my start in radio. And I also written for Al Jolson, Ed Wynn, Jack Haley, Joe Penner, Milton Burl, and many others. Mm-hmm. What did you do before you started writing for radio? Graham, I used to drive a cab. And believe it or not, that cab actually helped me to get my first radio job. How was that, Eddie? Well, it was about eight years ago. You see, between eight and nine in the evenings, I used to park my cab in front of the New Amsterdam Theater. In those days, Eddie Cantor was doing his broadcast there. I used to listen to the Cantor program and write down the jokes I thought he should have used on the show. Then right after the show, I'd go upstairs and see Eddie and tell him those jokes. Most of them were pretty punk. He wouldn't use them, but I kept right on trying. After giving him the jokes, I'd wait downstairs and drive him home. One night, I parked my cab in front of the New Amsterdam Theater, listened to Eddie Cantor's broadcast, and I hurried upstairs to the studio, and I... Wait a minute, buddy. The only people who can get through this corridor are the actors on the show. Listen, you're new around here, aren't you? Well, yeah. Then you don't know me. I'm Mr. Cantor's chauffeur. I just want to tell him where his car is parked. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Cantor. So I says to the guy, how do you like that guy? Was... Oh, hello, Davis. Say, look. You mind telling me just one thing? How were you able to pass the man at the door to get in here? Just personality, Mr. Cannon. Play place. But nevertheless, I got a joke I wanted you to do tonight. Yeah? Look, you could open up the program by saying, Jimmy, what do you think? This morning I opened up my closet and find a little Mort crying. And Jimmy says, wait a minute, who ever heard of a Mort crying? And you could say, well, didn't you ever hear of a Mort ball? <laughs> well, maybe I could have used something like that. Look, I got another one you could have used. You could use it next week. You, go, you open the program, you say, Jimmy, what does NBC stand for? Now, Wallington says, National Broadcasting Company. And you say, how do you like that? And all the time, I thought it was nothing but canter. Well, that's not bad. Look, look. Just on the chance I might be able to use it, Eddie, here's a little something for yourself. Can you imagine? I saw the gag to canter. Me, Eddie Davis, a cab driver. I'm selling jokes to canter. I gotta go before I faint. Oh, I, See, I, I, look, look, where are you going? I gotta phone my wife. Helen, you hear that? Tell the baby, Evelyn. I saw the gag to canter. How do you like that? Wait a what? second, wait a second. Maybe you can sell some more jokes to canter. I'm doing a routine on daylight saving time next week. I want some jokes on watches. You think you could write a couple? A couple? I'll write a hundred. I'll write a million. I'll write... Say, give me a nickel. I want it for my wife. I still can't... Oh, I, I, I'm so excited. I don't know what I'm saying, really. Wait, wait. You haven't written them yet. Going to be waiting for me downstairs and drive me home? Hey, am I? You're going to be driven like you never was driven before. <laughs> All right, Eddie, take me home. Okay, Mr. Cantor. Say, I've been thinking about those gags. You know, you told me to write for next week. You know, the ones about the watches. Look, Eddie, I'm a nervous man. I've got a wife and five children. Just as a favor to Cantor, please don't turn around when you talk. All right, all right. But look, about those watch gags. Suppose you were to come on a stage with a watch hanging out in, on, in the back of your pocket. And Wellington was to say, Eddie, what have you got that watch hanging out in the back pocket for? And you say, I can't help it. I'm behind times, Jimmy. You like that? Hey, look out for that truck! Hey, why don't you look where you're going, you big baloney? I'll flatten you. Yeah? You and who else? I've got cancer in my cab. I'll have him take a poke at it. Go ahead, Cantor. Show him how you fight. Listen, Go ahead. Davis, listen, I'm a comedian, not a prize fighter. That's the trouble with the cab business these days. These truck drivers think they own the street. Say, I got another watch gag. You could bring out a watch and show it to Wellington and say, you call it, you call it your wool white watch because it's always five to ten. You like that? Five to ten. Like well, where you going? Just, a, just scrape this fender a little bit and he puts up a big yell. How do you like a guy Listen, like Listen, Davis, as a personal favor to my wife, my five children, and my sponsor, will you please keep your eyes on the road? I'll keep my eyes on the road. Say, how about, a, how about this one? Show Wellington another watch and he says, Eddie, there's something missing on that watch. And you say, yes, I know. Things are so bad, I laid off one of the hands. <laughs> well, kid, there's one thing about you. You always keep on punching. I thought of another one. Listen to this one. Hey, look out! Say, Davis, as a matter of self-protection, next week I want you to work for me at a salary as a writer. I'd rather hire you than be killed by you. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie Davis, thank you. That was a strange beginning of a fine career. Letters from listeners. Each week we invite the listeners of Behind the Mic to write us questions about radio and the three or four we consider to be of most general interest, we have answered on the air by the radio editor of some outstanding newspaper or magazine. 
Tonight's questions will be answered by Al Newman, radio editor of the magazine Newsweek. <laughs> Mr. Philip N. Lewis of Salt Lake City writes in to ask, how does a sponsor tell whether his program is popular or not? Well, Mr. Lewis, there are certain organizations that specialize in finding out the comparative popularity of programs. This is mostly done by taking a cross-section of various areas in the country and finding out by telephone what programs people are listening to at the moment and what programs they've listened to during the day. The sponsor can sometimes tell about the popularity of his program by the increase of the sale of his product since the program went on the air. Miss Beulah Allison of New York City asks this. What is meant by the expression soap opera? Soap opera? or soap saga, as it's sometimes called, is slang for a daytime radio serial. They're so-called because so many of these serials are sponsored by large soap concerns. Mr. William White of Saranac Lake, New York, writes in to ask, I have often heard the word stooge used as pertaining to a radio character. Will you please tell me exactly what a stooge is and how did the word originate? Well, to take the last part of Mr. White's question first, there have been a great many explanations of the origin of stooge, but one of the most logical seems to be this. In the days when vaudeville was really vaudeville, and when an actor needed someone to say a few lines in his act, he'd sometimes hire an amateur to teach him and teach him how to deliver the lines, and maybe even how to sing a song. Such a person was called a student. Either through mispronunciation or carelessness, the word became stugent, and was eventually shortened to stooge. Through the course of years, the term stooge became applied to a professional actor who played a subsidiary part in a vaudeville act. On the air, the term stooge is generally applied to a minor comedy character. Some famous stooges of radio have been Park Your Carcass, Schlepperman of the Jack Benny program, Beetle of the Phil Baker program, and Tizzy Lish on the Al Pierce show. Thank you, Al Newman. Thank you for answering those questions. <laughs> radio broadcast helped save the life of a great football star. This past July, Ken Strong former All-American football player and star of the New York football giants, one of the greatest backs the game has ever produced was deathly ill. He was, but we'll let Ken tell it himself. Come on, he'll tell you about it. Ken Strong. Ken, exactly what was the matter with you? Well, Graham, I had a bad case of stomach ulcers and they had burst. I was operated on at the Flushing Hospital at one o'clock in the morning. The next night, I took a turn for the worse. I felt terrible. Not only physically ill, but mentally down. Not long before, my boy had had a ruptured appendix, and that and my own illness weighed upon me. There were two people I kept asking for, my two closest friends, Stan Lomax, a sports writer and commentator, and Tim Mara, the owner of the Giants. About three o'clock in the morning, the doctor phoned Stan, and he said, Hello, Mr. Lomax. Well, Ken is terribly sick. What worries me most, though, is his mental condition. It just doesn't seem as if he cares to get well. And he's got to if he's going to pull through. He needs something to shock him into one to fight and live. Isn't there something you can do? I think you can. Stan was a real friend, Graham. The next evening when he went on the air for his regular sports broadcast, this is what he said. Good evening, everyone. The greatest football player New York has ever produced, Ken Strong, is seriously ill at the Flushing Hospital. You've cheered him on the football field. Here's your chance to encourage him in something far more important, his fight for life. Write him and let him know that you're all pulling for him to win this biggest fight of all. Hello, Flushing Hospital. This is Herman Bagassi of Staten Island. Will you tell Ken Strong he's just got to get better and... Say, operator, I'm a cop. And Strong don't know me, but you tell him that all the boys on the force are pulling for him to come through. And be sure and tell him that... Say, what'll I do with these wires, miss? They're all for Ken Strong. I'll have them brought up to his room. Oh, look at all these letters, Mr. Strong. 
thousands of them from people who want you to get better. Well, Graham, when I found how people were pulling for me, I felt if I didn't get better, I'd be letting them and my family, my friends, and everybody down. And I knew this was one touchdown I had to make. You not only made it, Ken, but you knocked the Grim Reaper for a goal. And you're still with the New York Giants, of course. Yes, I am, Graham. And if any of those people that wrote or phoned the hospital are listening, I'd like to personally thank them from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you. And the very best of luck to you, Ken Strong, and also to your New York Giants. <laughs> gentlemen, if you have any questions about the inside of radio that you wish answered on the air, write a letter to us. Address it to Graham McNamee, Behind the Mic, National Broadcasting Company, New York City. As many questions as possible will be answered by mail, and the three or four questions we feel to be of most general interest will be answered on this program. Be sure to listen next week when we will bring you the inside story of football broadcasts, as told by Bill Stern and Swede Larson, coach of the Navy. What happened when a Zulu made his appearance on the radio broadcast? How radio brought help in the life and death crisis down in the Pacific Ocean? And more of the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, and the drama that are found behind the mic. This is Graham McNamee speaking. Good afternoon, all. <laughs> gentlemen, if you have any questions about the inside of radio that you wish answered on the air, be sure and write a letter to us and address it to Graham McNamee, Behind the Mic, National Broadcasting Company, New York City. Now all the questions, and as many as possible, will be answered by mail, and the three or four questions we feel to be of the most general interest will be answered on this program. Behind the Mic is written by Mort Lewis. Original music is composed and conducted by Ernie Watson. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.